I am glad to be here, though, and, and uh, thank you for uh, the, the uh, invite to come back. And I sense God's at work here, and, and that's a blessing. Our, our church, where I'm at in Lyons, Georgia, is really in a season where God is at work there as well. And uh, I'm just so thankful uh, to be in places where, where God is at work and, and He's in our midst. I, I, I'm delighted to, to be here with you today in this aspect that, that we have a lot to celebrate in the idea of being a part of the kingdom of God. And there may be some of you here today that you've not come to that place in your life where you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And, and you're going to sense that God's going to tug at your heart today and draw you and invite you to, to come and be one of his followers. And I'm going to encourage you when we get to the end of our time to be obedient to do that. But maybe you're here today and, and this message that I'm going to have for you today is going to be encouraging to you. And the fact is that I'm going to talk about 11 evidences uh, of what it means to be a genuine Christian. This idea of what, 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 what does conversion really look like? What does it do in the life of a person who has genuinely been saved or born again? Okay? And so we're going to look at that today. So if you have a copy of the Word of God, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. We're going to be looking really at verse number 5 and 6 in just a moment. I, well, I want to say thank you for praying for me this week. Uh, many of you who are here on Wednesday night and, and those of you who weren't here Wednesday and last night, you got to hear about my friend, who uh, Barry Benton, who was murdered this week. And um, I preached his funeral on Friday. And I, I was sitting there thinking about him this morning. You know, he, he'd been saved uh, last Sunday morning one week. And, and he was in the worship service, and I, I happened to be home that week, last week, and I'd been on the road a couple of weeks before that preaching in different churches, a Sunday through Thursday and a Sunday through Friday meeting. And, and, and I remember getting hung up in the back talking to some guys, and, and, and we, our, our, our praise team started up, and they were singing the song, Jesus Saves. And I, I, I went over there to, I, I saw Barry sitting there by his sister-in-law, and, and, and I, I, when I came up to go over to sit with my family, I, I saw him, and, and I, I just walked over to him, and I, and I took him by the hand, and, and before he got saved, he wasn't a hugger, okay? There's a lot of things change when you get saved, all right? But, but when the, the eight days, he hugged me more than he ever hugged me, the last eight days of his life. But, but he, when I stuck my hand out, he grabbed my hand, he put his arm around my neck, and I said, Barry Ben, I just want you to know that Jesus saves. And I said, I guess you already know that by now. And he was grinning like an old mule eating briars. And he said, I do. And then we tragically lost him on Monday night sometime, but I, I just want you to know his death is not in vain. We had several people saved at his funeral, and I believe his story is going to impact a lot of people before it's over with. So I just want to say thank you for those of you who knew about that and, and prayed, and, and they're still looking. And I talked to his brother this morning, and they've got some suspects, and so hopefully we'll get to the bottom of all of this. But then it's going to be a real test for the family, right? It's going to be a real test for the family to forgive this individual or individuals, we believe, and be able to put that behind them. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they catch them so I can have the opportunity to go sit down in front of them where they're incarcerated and say this to them. You killed my friend, and I forgive you for that. And let me tell you why I forgive you for that. Now, you can find the same forgiveness that I found 22 years ago if you'll just receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You see, humanly, that's not possible because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's a possibility, amen? And that's the eternal outlook we need to look on because those people that committed this heinous act are still souls that need to be saved. By the way, there's another criminal that we're going to be reading about today that actually wrote the passage that I'm going to be talking about. He was the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the church at Corinth, and he's, he's had some people challenge his apostleship, and, and, he, and he asked them to do something actually commands them to do something in verse 5 and verse number 6. He says this in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test. 
So Paul here is actually putting this upon the people. He's, he's asking them to test themselves. Now that word test there means to try or to prove in a good sense. Paul wasn't wanting them to doubt their salvation. He was just wanting them to make sure they were saved, right? He was wanting them to see if, if, if they were genuinely converted, if they had truly been born again. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, is there enough, if we were examined before a court of law and we were to look at the evidence in our life and how we live Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday when we come together, would, we, would, would a jury be able to find us guilty of being a follower of Jesus Christ? Okay? Because let me tell you what held my friend up for a long time for being saved. And I mentioned this briefly last night. He saw people who said they were saved that were in church on Sunday, and then he saw how they lived Monday through Saturday, and that's not what he wanted in his life. That's not what he needed. That's not what was going to set him free. What was going to set him free was to see somebody who was authentic that tried to live Monday through Saturday what they professed they believed on Sunday. That's the kind of revival we need, isn't it? And so he says here, we want, we want you to put yourselves to the test. And then he uses the word examine. And that means to distinguish or discern or approve, to see if something is authentic. If you go to the bank, many times they'll, 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 take, uh, they'll take that $100 bill and they'll look up at it like this or in the store, right? They're looking for that seal to see what, whether or not it's authentic. When I went to the airport yesterday in Atlanta, they always, when I handed my ID, they got this little light and they flash it on there to be able to see the seal that's inside there to see if it's authentic. If uh, you take a, a ring to a jeweler, he's going to pull out that funny little glass, right? I don't even know what that's called. I guess we don't have diamonds big enough to worry about it, but I know Delana doesn't. <laughs> But the only one she has when we got married, and that's probably all she's ever going to get. I love her, though. But they pull out that little spectacle there, and they examine that ring to see if what, that, what, what really is there is what? If it's authentic, right? We see, the Word of God really exposes us to see whether or not we're authentic. Now, there may be some areas today that you say that you need, to, you, you need to work on after we've had our time together today as a believer. But some of these things, most all of these things need to be in your life at some level, okay? They may be small. They may just be one grape on the vine there, okay? But what we want to do is we want to see those things multiply. And so we don't want to fail the test. And so I've written down here 11 evidences that I actually borrowed from another scholar. You know, you always got to study people that are smarter than you are. And, and, and I trust this guy, and, and, but I put my own meat to it, okay? So these 11 things that we're going to get here is, is something that I've plucked from somewhere else. So we just go ahead and give credit where credit's due. But the first one is this. If you and I are genuinely saved, if we're genuinely in the faith, we should have a love for God, okay? Jesus said the greatest commandment is this. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the greatest and foremost commandment. There's nothing greater than that than our love for God. Everything you and I do for the Lord then should flow out of our overflow of our love for Him, right? I didn't have to get on a plane yesterday and come up here and preach last night and get to preach this week. I get to do that, okay? And, it's, and I'm not doing it to try to earn favor with God. I'm doing it because he's already favored me and giving me his grace and his son. And so it's an act of worship to me to be able to do what I do. And you and I are to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And love really manifests itself in obedience, doesn't it? Listen to this. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Did he say that really? I mean, I thought love was just expressing it, right, with your hands held high. Well, that's part of it, isn't it? But love is really demonstration. If I just told my wife that I loved her and I never demonstrated to her that I loved her, do you think she'd believe me? Y'all go like this. No. She wouldn't believe me because I was not demonstrating that. There must be a demonstration in this idea that, that we love God, so we're going to find out what his book says and what he says do, we're going to do, and what he says not do, we're going to, we're going to pull back from those things. 
And it's an obedience because we love him. Because of what he's done for us in sending his son. And so there's a genuine love for God. Love's not some kind of this smoozy woozy feeling. You know what I'm saying? Everybody thinks love ought to have a, it ought to be a warm fuzzy. Right? You want a warm fuzzy, get you a cotton ball and a hair dryer. <laughs> this is manifest in obedience, right? It, it's obeying him. It's finding out what his word says and putting into practice. The second thing we should see is a genuine repentance from sin. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, these people turned to God, they turned from idolatry and sin to serve the living God. You and I need to have a, a break from sin and, and continually we're repenting of sin, we're turning from it, and, and, and we're, we're turning away from that and putting in our lives what's good. You know, in, in, in the idea of, of this idea of repentance in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible says that there's a, a worldly sorrow that doesn't lead us to repentance. That is the sorrow that you got caught, Right? There's a lot of people that are sorry they got caught in their sin. But they're not genuinely sorry that they sinned against God. And there's a difference there, right? The sorrow that they got caught is the sorrow that, that they wish they, they hadn't have done what they did. Maybe they wish they hadn't hurt somebody. Maybe they wish they hadn't got caught or something along that. And that's not genuine repentance. Genuine repentance is this idea that begins that I'm sorry that I did this because I sinned against God. And I know that I need to make that right. That's what repentance is. And when you're, when you're genuinely sorry that you sinned against God, then it causes you to want to do different, doesn't it? It causes you to want to change some things if you knew you, you did what you weren't supposed to do. So love for God, genuine repentance from sin. And in the life of the believer, those things are growing, right? They're ongoing in our life. The third thing is genuine humility. It's, it's not the idea that, that you got it all together, right? Whoever's got it all together, please stand up. Let me sit down, okay? It, it's this idea that, that we think we're better than everybody else. That's not genuine humility, is it? In fact, it's if you have somebody come to you and talk to you about how humble they are, you need to run, <laughs> Because that is, that is the, the greatest indication that they're full of pride if they talk to you about their humility. You know, the biggest problem with me and my growth in Christ is me. And God just wants to knock more of me out of me so more of him could be Lord in my life and he could live through me. I'm the greatest enemy that I have at many times in my own sinful nature. I don't warrant the activity of the devil most of the time. My old flesh is just bad enough. And we've got to come to the place in our life where we realize that, 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 listen, I love that song, how deep the Father's love for us. We sang that at the funeral this week, that he made a wretch his treasure. A lot of people said, I don't, I don't like wretch theology. Well, you don't like the Bible. Because before Christ, we were a wretch. We are what enmity with God. We were, we were at war with God. We were God's enemy. While he loved us and he's made provision for us, we're at war with God because of our flesh. And it's not until we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior that he makes a wretch his treasure. You probably didn't think you were a treasure this morning, did you? Maybe you hadn't thought about that in a while. That's humbling, isn't it? To know that you couldn't do anything to earn your salvation. That it's a gift from God. So genuine humility ought to be in your life. The next one is this idea, number four, the devotion to God's glory. You know, Isaiah 43, 7 says, God made us for his glory. He also says, in, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whatever, Paul said, whatever you do, make sure you have God in mind, right? Whatever you do, whether you're, whether you're eating, whether you're, whether you're having something to drink, whether you're working, 
Whether you're playing in the yard, whether you're serving, whatever it is, you have the mindset as a believer that you want to glorify God. Everything you do, everything you watch, everything you listen to, you want to be devoted to the glory of God. Listen to me. That's going to repel some people. I'm just telling you. But it's going to attract others. To some, that's going to be repulsive. To others, it's going to be good. It's going to be a sweet aroma to them. And so whatever it is, we say we want to glorify God with our life as a believer. The fifth thing is this idea of continual prayer. That we have a desire to pray. We have a desire to, to, to pray at all times, to, to pray with perseverance, to pray without ceasing. Now, sometimes prayer can be the most difficult thing for a believer because you can be reading your Bible and having your devotion time. This I've experienced this. I'm reading my Bible. I'm having my devotion time in the morning, and, and all of a sudden I've finished the Bible reading portion. I've journaled some things down, and I go to prayer time. When I go to that, then my mind is bombarded with all kinds of crazy things. Why do you think that is? Because the devil doesn't want you to pray. In fact, as I love what the old Methodist pastor said Samuel Chadwick many many years ago he said he said the devil laughs many times at our preaching and and our service but he trembles when we pray why because prayer is not listen listen to this prayer is not so we can do the greater work prayer is the greater work I'm convinced my my friend got saved because we were praying for him there's 70 men plus on a list that we, that we pray over every Monday morning at 6 a.m. There's a group of us from anywhere from 7 or 8 to 18 that gather together at the high school on Monday morning, and there's 70 plus men in our community that are either lost or in desperate need of repentance in their life, and we're praying for them that God would do a work in their life, and Barry was on that list. And he's the first one that we've seen that's been saved out of that. And I believe because of that, there are going to be many, many others that are going to come to know the Lord. But if you're genuinely saved, you have a desire to pray because the Holy Spirit lives in you. The sixth thing is that you have a, a selfless love. You, you desire to, to sacrifice for others because love is an action verb, right? It is, it is something we do, not just something we say. And so, and so we desire to be selfless. You mothers understand that more than probably anybody in the building, especially when, when you have a small child at home, right? You have that baby in the house, and, 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 if, and, and most of your husbands were probably like I was. And as, when we got to the fourth one, I was 40, and eight days later, he was born. And he's off in another room, and I'd get up the next morning, and I'd say, well, honey, he, that, that was a pretty good night, wasn't it? And if looks could have killed, I'd never be here doing this revival. She said, I was up all night with him. I said, well, I'm sorry. I never heard anything. <laughs> but she was up doing for that child because he couldn't do for himself. And it was the idea that you're sacrificing for that child. And, and the same thing happens in the church, right? You're sacrificing. You're doing things for people that you wouldn't normally do if you had your own... <laughs> if you just had perfect freedom to do whatever you wanted to do. Why? Because you, <laughs> your Savior did that, didn't he? Didn't he go to the cross? You know, I, I, people say sometimes, well, being in the will of God is the safest place to be. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Being the will of God may be the best place to be, but it may be a very dangerous place. The will of God got Jesus hung on the cross. The will of God got Paul's head cut off. The will of God got Peter crucified upside down. The will of God right now is getting many of our Christian brothers and sisters martyred right now in the Middle East because they're in the will of God. The will of God is not always the safest place to be. The will of God is the best place to be. And we find what the will of God is as we begin to live selfless and we begin to think about others instead of just us. 
We begin to pour ourselves out into other people. The seventh thing here is the separation from the world. How well are you really separating yourself from the world? Now, I'm not talking about isolation. I'm talking about good insulation. Isolation is you move off somewhere else and you just kind of camp out and you start a compound, you wait on a hill somewhere, and that's where most of our churches uh, are in our convention. And by the way, at one time you were there, weren't you? Y'all go like this, right? You, you were just there. And, and because, what, the reason you've seen God move in all this is because you've taken the gospel outside the building. That's the only reason that you've seen what you're doing. And the moment that you stop that, this river will dry up. But it doesn't mean that you had to go out and act like the world, right? In order to reach them. You didn't have to go. You know what? I, 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 this is a, a craze today, but people think they've got to do all kinds of things to their body to be able to connect with somebody. I never have figured that out. They just think they got to look like the world and do everything. Listen, God's called us to be different, right? We're a peculiar people. Some of us are more peculiar than others, right? That's not licensed to be Lulu. But it means that we're not always engaged in the world's methods, in the world's system. We, we, there's a healthy separation from the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. What's worldly? Anything that we can define that is worldly is anything that's in opposition to God and His Word. So, w w you want a list? I'll give you a list. Immorality, drunkenness, pride, self-centeredness, disobedience. All of these things are, are, are worldly. And, and anything that's against the Word of God. And so you could go on and on and on about this. I, I want to submit to you that I think that people that are out there that are lost want to see something different in our lives, don't they? Listen, I wasn't saved very long, and I had, I had, a, I had a drinking problem when I got saved. And I, I'll never forget this as long as I live, as long as the Lord gives me mind to think about it. I, I went from, from, from staying that way a lot of the weekend, Friday to Sunday and part of the week, to, to just occasionally having one for, for a little while after I got saved. And then eventually, probably a year or so after that, I could take you to the spot on the map where I poured the last one out. God told me that it, was, it was over. That's where, that's where God brought me. But I can remember not long after I was saved, I came into the house where my mom and dad were living, and I wanted my parents to be saved more than anything. And I was with a buddy of mine, and we brought a 12-pack into the house and put it in the refrigerator. My dad, sometimes he was a man of few words, so you had to listen well. This is what he said. I'm 22, 23 years old. He said, I thought that was against your religion. You could have cut me from ear to ear and you wouldn't hurt me any more than that hurt me that day. Because I realized I damaged my witness with the man that I wanted to be saved more than anything. Because the lost world expects me not to drink. They expect Christians not to do that. And if it's going to cause somebody to stumble, then you had not ought to do it, right? By the way, I could give you a whole sermonette on that deal right there, and I'm not going to do that right now. But I, I want to tell you this. We need to be separated from the world to make a difference. Number eight, we need to be growing spiritually. We need to, as Luke 8, 15 says, hear the word and hold it fast. We need to apply. This, this, this is for your edification today. You're to, you're to hear what we say. You're to hear what the Word of God has to say. And then you're to go out and put it into practice, right? It's, it's life in action. You're to put the Word of God into practice. We're to be growing. That's how we grow spiritually. God has given gifted men in the church, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the building up of the body of Christ to teach them that they might become mature in the faith. 
But if you don't work out, if you're not obedient, you're not going to become, you're not going to become mature. It's just, it's just that simple. You have to work that muscle to bring it to maturity, right? What happens to all of us when we get older is we quit working out, don't we? That big chest we had when we were younger, it all kind of gets down here, doesn't it? We're not working out those muscles, right? We want the young people to pull their pants up, and then when we get older, we wear them up so high that we, we need to pull them down a little bit. Right? You need to have a sign on the door. No entry if your pants are too low or too high. But it's this idea of working out and this idea of obedience and reading the Word of God and growing spiritually. And as we were talking about this morning in our small group study that we were together with the men, this is, the Christian life is not a 40-yard dash. It's a marathon. And, and, and you're, it, it's long-term here. You've you got to take off at a good pace, but you, you need to keep after it. You need to keep reading your Bible and keep studying and, and keep praying and doing those things over years and years and years and years and years and years because we always overestimate what we can get done in one year and we underestimate what can happen in five years of us plodding along and being faithful to do what God wants us to do. And it's not the, you growing yourself. It's the Holy Spirit that grows you. And you're giving yourself to that process. And so we, we give ourselves to spiritual growth. A genuine believer desires to grow spiritually. Number nine, a, a genuine believer is obedient. And we talked about that a little bit. But Jesus, let me talk to you about how important obedience really is in the life of the Christian. In fact, is as Jesus is winding up the Sermon on the Mount, really giving his invitation, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, he says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now, wait a minute here. Aren't we saved by grace through faith and that alone in Jesus Christ? Isn't that true? Y'all go like this. It is. It is true. But listen, this is what grace does. If you truly have been born again and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you will have a desire to carry out the will of God. Will you be perfect? No. But you'll have a desire to be obedient to the Word of God and the ways of God. You'll have a desire to do that. If you say that you've been born again and you have no desire to carry out the will of God for your life, listen, you've been deceived. You're not a believer. The devil has you duped. He's deceived you into thinking that you got something that you don't really have. And that's where he has a lot of folks. But a genuine believer desires to be obedient. Now, is obedience always easy? No. But Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He says, my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow me. God will require you to do some things that will stretch your faith. He'll require you to do some things that you don't want to do. But if we're genuinely saved, obedience is our option. And it's option A and option A only, right? And when we don't obey, we have to confess that as sin, right? Number 10, we're almost done here. We should be done by about 3. If we're here at 3, God's here and we don't want to leave, okay? Number 10 is a hunger for God's Word. He has a, as a baby craves milk... So a Christian ought to crave the Word of God. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't know Psalms from Palms and Job from Job. I, I had no clue. And I, I sat over in the corner with my thumb in the index. By the way, it's a good idea to bring your Bible to church if you come. But I, I remember I'd have my thumb in the index, and when my Pastor Jack would announce the text, I would find the book. I'm thinking, is that Old Testament or New Testament? I'd start, oh, ah, there it is. And so I'd say, okay, in my Bible, that's page 986. So I'd go over there because I, did, I didn't know my Bible. I, I, but, but you know what? Every morning 
I would get up and I would read it every morning. Probably, listen to this, probably the greatest thing that I've ever done as a believer is try to be faithful in getting up every morning and reading this book before I go anywhere. I can't tell you the times God's spoken to me and directed me and guided me and even given me things for the day that I didn't know I was going to need until that happened that day. I'm thinking, well, that's strange. And then something would happen that day, and I'm saying, okay, that's why. <laughs> it's this idea of walking with God. The idea of the journey, the idea of craving His Word, that we, want to, that we desire it, that we hunger and thirst after the things of God. And then number 11 is kind of general over everything we talked about. It's this idea of transformation of life. That you're not, you're not the same as you used to be. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, any new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And God changes you. My wife's pastor in Savannah, Georgia, used to say, he changes your wanter. <laughs> There's things you just don't want to do anymore. And he gives you a new heart. He gives you a new desire. Listen, you know that story in John chapter 3 where, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Torah toter, I'm sure, right? He probably had a scroll under his arm. He was a religious man that never had come to the place where he'd known Jesus yet. And Jesus is telling him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You can't get this if you're not born again. And Jesus gives an illustration in the midst of all of that conversation that I find intriguing. And he says this, and this is one that's easy where we can all get it, okay? I, I like to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where we can reach them, okay? And this is what Jesus says to Nicodemus. He says to him, basically, and this is my paraphrase, that you that you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind, right? You and I can't see the Holy Spirit. We can't put our eyes upon the Holy Spirit, but we can see the effects of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life. When the wind's blowing across my hilltop where I live in South Georgia, and, and it may be blow a tree down or shingles off my roof or whatever it might do, when it's doing that, I can't see the wind itself, but I see the effects of it. The same thing is true with a person's life who has been touched by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus Christ is living inside of us, then, then there should be some evidence that we indeed have been born again. And by the way, if there is evidence, you have great cause for rejoicing. Amen? That ought to bring you comfort and peace. And I'm telling you, when I got saved, mom and dad thought somebody come stole their son. You know what I'm saying? And who is this guy? What's wrong with him? All he wants to do now is go to church, hang out with church people. I ate more fried chicken, strawberry pie after I got saved than I had my whole life before then. My pastor probably wished I'd go home sometime, but they had good food at their house. <laughs> and, and when you're used to hanging out the copperhead in the long branch, you've got to find something else to do. There needs to be a change of scenery there. And thank God for His grace. Whether we're saved at 8, 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, 88. I had an 89-year-old woman one time I led to Christ in the hospital. Big tears rolled down her face onto that pillow. She was laying there and she said, Well, Brother Ronnie, I guess now I need to get baptized. Well, yeah, actually you do. It's amazing when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside a person how automatically things begin to change. They just begin to change. God begins to do a work. You begin to worship. You begin to witness. I remember this week one story about Barry. I'm going to try not to talk to him about, about him all week. There's a woman that broke down out in front of her house. She ran out of water in her car. And she was kind of a rough lady. And Barry went out and, and tried to help her with what was going on, figured out she was out of water, and he put some water in her car, and they lived just about two or three miles out of town. 
And he said, I tell you what I'll do, I'll follow you to town, make sure you get there. So he follows her to town and, and makes sure she gets there and, and she gets to where she's going. He pulls up beside her and, and, and basically they were saying goodbye to each other and she comes out and she said, what do I owe you? How can I pay you? He said, you don't owe me anything. I just want you to go to church somewhere. See, that's not that big a deal. Is oh yeah, it was for him. It was for him compared to what his life was like just a week before. As my five-year-old says, that's huge. <laughs> that's huge, Daddy. You know, you have to explain those things to children, don't you? My five-year-old this week said this. He at the funeral. He got choked up because he went with us on Saturday to help us move that deer stand. And, and Barry looked at him in the back window when he was sitting in the back seat of my truck. And he waved at him, smiled, and he said, Bye, Justin. Justin will never forget that. And he brought that up at the funeral one day. And he said, Mommy, I, I think I'm about to cry. I'm worried about Mr. Barry. And my wife said, You don't have to worry about Mr. Barry. Mr. Barry's okay now. Why? Because of what he chose to do eight days before he died? Sealed it. He had 51 years of living life as a wretch. And eight days as a child of God. And eight seconds would have been enough <laughs> to get him there. Let me ask you this. Is there enough evidence in your life of the things that I've said today that you could say, yeah, I'm a Christian? Yeah, there's evidence that I've been born again, that the Holy Spirit lives in me, that I'm being changed. If not, friend, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived and think you've got it all together and you got it right. It's, not, it's more than just coming to this building on Sunday. If you went and sat in your garage all afternoon, do you think you'd become a car? You wouldn't, would you? Right? Then why do we think coming and just sitting in church is going to make us Christian? It won't happen. You've got to repent of your sin and trust Christ by faith as your Lord and Savior. And listen then you're becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. That's just the beginning of the journey. You're surrendering your life to the Lordship of Christ. And if you don't want that, you don't want Jesus as Savior. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't separate who He is. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, thank God there's some of those evidences in my life, right? Some of them, though, may need some attention, don't they? You need to surrender afresh and new in some areas. Whatever that is, friend, listen to me. You make sure you get that right today. Because you're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the rest of the day. You have this moment in time as a grace gift of Almighty God. And that's it. That's it. And what you do with Christ today, or what you've already done with Him, is where you're going to spend eternity on that day that He calls you home. And so let me ask you this. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you say, there's no evidence in my life that I'm saved based upon what you've said. I've failed the test. I, I've examined myself. I don't see any of these things in my life. Then the best thing you can do in a moment when we have this invitation is come give your life to Christ. Pastor Don's going to be standing here in just a moment up front. We're going to invite you, if you're here today and you want to be saved, to step out from where you are and come down this aisle and tell him that you need to be saved. Maybe you're here today and you made a profession of faith last night in our banquet. It's important for you to make that decision known to your pastor. 
and he'll talk to you about making that decision public. But if you made a profession of faith last night in our banquet, we want you to come forward this morning as well. But maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Ronnie, I'm a believer, but there's some things in my life the Holy Spirit convicted me about. Then I want you to come get around this altar this morning and the Spirit of God leads you and get that right. You be obedient to what God tells you to do, okay? Maybe you want to come and, and, and just cry out to God that He'd move in our midst this week. Maybe you want to come and just commit to be here this week. You know what I found out? We're as close to God as we want to be. We're really as close to God as we want to be. And if He's distant... Whose fault is it? It's not God's fault. It's your fault. It's my fault. Maybe we need to move closer. The Bible says if we draw near to God, He'll draw near to us. We want fellowship with Him. He's going to want to fellowship with us. Maybe this week and even this morning, you need to make a commitment fresh and anew that you want to draw near to Him so He can draw near to you. And God only knows what can happen if that's the case. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to ask Don to come. I'm going to pray. And as I pray, those of you who need to come and be saved today, I'm going to encourage you to step out from where you're seated and tell him. Those of you who made profession of faith, you need to come. I'm going to encourage you to do that. Those of you who want to join me around this altar and pray, you need to come and do that this morning. You be obedient to the prompting of the Spirit of God.